Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today we are beginning our discussion of The Persians by Aeschylus. Now, I intended to read the whole play because it's not really all that long last night, but I had pages and pages of notes by about halfway through that I decided to just pause halfway through and we'll finish up our discussion tomorrow. So one of the things that I find really helpful is at the beginning of every play they always have like the dramatist person I or like the list of all of the characters. I always put that in my notes because I know that that's something that I'll want to refer to more than once. Unlike a novel, there's not really descriptions about characters or identifiers about characters and that sort of thing. And in fact, even for Greek plays, the identification was not obvious upon first blush and a lot of times these plays are being performed for the first time for this competition so what you'll see is that the, in the opening lines they have to announce who they are or uh, another character will announce them so for this play it opens with the chorus and they come out and say we're, we're the like Persian elders we're the sort of council of elders and here in the palace of Susa right and so they kind of just like have to announce themselves so that the audience can know who they are and what's going on. Already from the beginning we see that emphasis on cultural difference. We have repeated language around the mourning of a widow. That you're going to use this imagery a lot of the, the widow who is mourning, which is both a literal and uh, takes in a more expansive meaning. It's literal on the level that a lot of their men will die in battle and so there's going to be widows in their society but it's also more expansive because they use that imagery to sort of express the grief of the nation as a whole. Um, there's an emphasis also on monarchy throughout these opening lines where again there, this play is very empathetic to the plight of their very own enemy, their very own recent enemy. And it's taking that really empathetic view. And it reminds me even of the video that I did of empathetic Hector in my Iliad series. So theoretically, the Greeks who are telling this story about this Greek victory are most empathetic to the Greeks. But what we see is actually that we have a very empathetic view of Hector, when it, the best warrior on the opposite side, and even of the women and their experience being among the defeated peoples. And we see that kind of trend happening here too. This must have been something that the Greeks meditated on a lot. Anyway, but so they're not really othering or exoticizing their opponent or saying that they're bad or poo-pooing them as people, but what they are doing is sort of making, what we do see in this play is like making the argument that democracy is superior to monarchy. And that's a theme that's going to come up more than once. The list of foreign names, when we sort of go through and list all the generals and warriors from the Persian side, again, serves to emphasize that cultural difference because uh, Aeschylus is writing these very non-Greek sounding names on purpose and putting them all together in this sort of litany of, of men. the wrong way. They spend a long time talking about how large their forces are, how much larger the Persian forces are than the Greek forces were, and it reinforces this idea that this is something of divine proportion, of divine intervention, that the Greeks would not have won if the gods hadn't ordered it, which means that they, the Persians have done something very wrong for the gods to sort of like come against it so strongly. The opening speech also includes the first reference to the idea that they want to put a yoke of slavery upon Greece. So I mentioned it in my last video, but this Greek word that has to do with links, with chains, uh, but can also be translated as yoke. And he's going to use this word over and over again to um, reinforce this symbol. And in fact, symbolism is one of my favorite tools in literature for this reason. It symbols, unlike metaphors or similes where you have like a one-to-one -one relationship with symbols you have a one-to-many relationship so for example the moon can symbolize many things it can symbolize love it can symbolize um virginity because it's associated with the goddess diana it can first it can symbolize inconstancy because the moon waxes and wanes it can symbolize coldness and distance because it's you know silvery and in the distance you know and you only see it at night 
um, which nights are generally colder than days, right? And so there's these multiplicity of meanings that you have associated with the moon. And the same thing is going to be true for this word zugma. You're going to have these multiplicity of meanings, but where a symbol becomes really, really powerful is not that the meanings fan out, but that they stack on each other. And it's you can see it, think of it almost as like, a Venn diagram and the areas where the symbols overlap is that precise meaning as the sort of, <laughs> that's such an inappropriate way for me to, but where the sort of symbols in the language overlaps is that precise meaning when you layer, you know, three, four, five different types of meaning on top of the symbol where it all sort of coalesces and collapses down on itself is where, you know, the, the writer of the story or the writer of the play in this case is sort of uh, specifying, getting actually increasingly specific in their meaning. It becomes actually more restrictive, not more expansive, if you will. They also describe the bridge that is constructed across the Hellespont. It's another instance of yoking um, slash linking. They actually use both of these words in this translation, um, at least. So they also refer to the ocean as a blue murderous serpent. And we talked about how powerful this image of a serpent was like out in the oceans with uh, Jormungandr actually in the Norse mythology when we talked about the cosmology that they have. Jormungandr is that big serpent that goes around the whole ocean of Midgard. Well, we have that same imagery being repeated here in a totally unconnected culture. They had no contact with each other, separated by time and geography, using that same imagery to express this idea of chaos. It's this unconquerable force. It's dangerous. And with that, we see that the defeat of the Hellespont is considered overreaching, that this conquering of this force of nature is considered, you know, this act of Ate. And here, I can't help but think of Achilles with his battle with Scamandros, where Scamandros is finally like, Achilles, you are whipped up into such a rage. I, why are you fighting with me? I am a god. Like, calm down. Go, like, focus up, dude. Focus up. And so Ate sort of leads these men into nets and snares of their own creation is really what it comes down to for the Persians, at least. And this is why the elders dread and fear and express mourning, even though at this point in the play, they don't yet know the outcome of the battle. Now here we have a really good example of dramatic irony where the audience, the Greeks, who are now eight years past the end of this war, they know the outcome, they know what happened, the Greeks won, but the characters in the play haven't learned that information yet. The imagery of yoking is then extended to the widows who are left alone in Persia using the idea of a yoke uh, as, a, as a metaphor for marriage is uh, quite common. It's used in biblical language as well. And again, I'm just so impressed, I guess, by this sympathetic approach. Queen Atosa, who is the mother of Xerxes and the widow of Darius, again, this emphasis on, on the experience of the widow now comes on the scene. and. Uh, she worries, her, her, the worries that she initially expresses are quite interesting. She worries that they have too much wealth without the men to guard it. And thus we have this idea that wealth and power ought to be commensurate. And in fact, that has to do with the idea of time or honor, the Greek perception of honor. And that's really at core to the disagreement that sort of sets off the Iliad. And we talked about it in that video as well. I feel like as I go on and talk <laughs> about literature every day, one, you guys are gonna start to realize that I have like a handful of concepts that I know about and I keep repeating them. And two, I'm gonna keep like circling, <laughs> like referring back to all of these different videos. My cards are gonna get intense in, <laughs> it's a, but it's all interconnected. It's a giant interconnected system, you guys. Anyway, I'm gonna stop being weird. Her, her dream is very interesting as well. So basically, the dream that she has is that we have one woman dressed in Persian garb and one woman dressed in Greek garb, and they are sisters. And uh, Xerxes has tried to yoke them together, and the Persian one submits to the bridle and the yoke, but the Greek one breaks free and is really chaotic and runs off and refuses to submit to the yoke essentially of monarchy. So of course this is intended to be interpreted as like a divine dream that's coming from the gods, giving a Queen Atosa 
particular insight into what is going on with her son Xerxes in battle. And this again reinforces the idea that the gods are considering it overreaching for Xerxes, that he was given Persia, he was given the east to have dominion over, but he is overreaching as he goes into the west, as he heads towards Europe, that that is not the domain or um, sort of the province of his power. And I think by making these two figures sisters in her dream, it refers to that grander idea that of, of humanity as a whole, that we're all humans together. And even though they come from different cultures, that they're genetically unique, that they're culturally unique, that they're linguistically unique, that they're ethnically unique from one another, or distinct from one another, I should say, that they are bound together in this experiment of humanity. And again, of course, extending the imagery of the yoke. I'm gonna say it like 16 times in this video. I should do a counter like other YouTubers do, but I won't because I'm lazy. Her religious practice afterwards, where she's sort of making these uh, petitions to the gods, and then she kind of has this, uh, this where she's seeing augurs. For the Greeks, they often interpreted the flights of birds. I have no idea what the Persian practices were of this time, because. I am a poor historian, but it really just sounds like a duplicate of what the Greek practices were. So if anybody has more knowledge in this area, I'd be really, really curious to know if this is actually a, an accurate representation of what a Persian queen of about the fifth century AD, no, the fifth century BC, I always scramble that up. It sounds like an, it sound like an idiot, but I do know that we're talking about BC. Um, would have done because this seems Greek to me. Again, we have this negative view of monarchy. Atosa sort of on her exiting speech says that if Xerxes fail, he'll still be queen, king, like he can't be held to account. So this idea of like constitutional monarchy, of course, hasn't really come into conception. That's going to come into conception with like common law in England and all of that business. And so this idea that like the, the that you can't hold justice to the arbiter of justice, who is the king himself, is a, an essential problem for the Greeks as far as they viewed monarchy, and that is coming up here as well. The elders seem to think that the dream could be either meaningless or could be prayed away, so they're not taking it very seriously, even though they came out and said that they had their own worries and fears that the battle might be going awry. One of Queen Atosa's lines, it's line 294, she says, yet necessity makes us mortals bear the pains the gods bestow. And this relates to that idea of like, how do we deal with suffering in life? Like suffering is inevitable. Um, the gods are gonna give you good things and bad things, and you have to figure out as a human being how to cope with it. Again, there's not a real sense that you're gonna pray to the gods. I mean, you might offer up a prayer for the gods to, as, as they suggest, alleviate your suffering, but that doesn't mean that you're gonna live, the, live this blessed and charmed life where there's no suffering. We find out that Xerxes lives, but then a long list in contrast of all of the men who died as a result of his hubris, as a result of his overreaching, as a result of his foolishness, right? Uh, and, and in this way, like how similar is this to like Roland? You know, he goes into battle with this hubris, all of these men die all around him, and even when he comes to like the end of his life and he's about to die himself, he fails to understand really what a contributing force he was to this outcome. And I think this, you know, oh, Xerxes lived, and then boom, all of this text of all of these names serves to emphasize a simple, similar point. We learn that um, Xerxes believed a false message from the Greeks, and that sort of is what prompted this fall in this this battle that was went so horribly for the Persians. It goes on and talks about like all, they faced this defeat on the sea, then they tried to retreat, and then they faced this other defeat, and then they tried to get water, and they're all like dying from basically thirst, and they can't get water, and the gods are against them, and they freeze the rope. I mean, it's just like an absolute disaster. Like the, the messenger's story is like disaster upon disaster upon disaster. And it's so overwhelming that the evidence is that the, like the gods were really, really against the Persians in this endeavor. But the whole thing is kicked off because 
Xerxes believed a messenger who himself was Greek. And so I think as an audience member, and as a reader at least, I'm like, why'd you believe that guy? Like, why did you go on his advice? What, what about that seemed like a good idea? But again, perhaps it's emphasizing this idea of hubris that he thought, you know, whether this message was true or not, his forces were so much bigger that he was basically, like he had it in the bag. There was no chance that he could lose. Little did he know that the gods were bringing a smackdown. Uh, very, very briefly, uh, we switch to the Greek perspective in the midst of this battle, and we see them sort of talking about how the Persian language sounds like babbling to them, which is quite a common like Greek uh, reaction, I guess, to foreign peoples. Even the word barbarian comes from the Greek like noise sound that they associated with foreign languages. So they would say that other people who are speaking foreign languages would say bar, bar, bar. So that's where the word barbarian comes from. At this point, like a new set of imagery comes out in this discussion of how the battle went, which is this imagery of order versus disorder, of chaos versus like just being organized. And we see that the Greeks are very organized. They come out in their phalanxes, they're in order, they're in line. And we see that the Persian troops are quickly smattered into disorder. And by the time we get to the end of the battle and the end of the messenger's narrative, there's this sense that the amount of suffering that the gods can bear is so crushing, it's more than a single man can can tolerate. It's more than you can bear in your life. It's like this overwhelming wave. And I think, you know, they've really latched onto something there because I, you know, I have known people who have gone, I mean, it's, it's true even of like Angela's Ashes that we read just a few weeks ago. It's like a tragedy upon tragedy upon unwarranted thing upon accident upon you know some of it is self-imposed some of it is self-created because of the father's addiction to alcohol and so there's going to be a breakdown in the proper order of life because he can't overcome um, you know this propensity for alcohol and I think this idea that that like the gods kind of bring this that have this capacity to bring this crushing grief, this crushing suffering upon humanity is, is really a true one. I think it's, it's borne out in people's lives more often than we would like to admit. Atosa, Queen Atosa is mad that the elders gave a bad interpretation of her dream, and she also seems to think that Xerxes could still have the potential of making things worse. She fears that he hasn't been properly humbled by this experience. And then there's another long exploration of the widow's grief. Um, and this becomes a vessel for their grief examination, as I talked about, and it becomes even more palpably clear in this particular passage. And here we get this idea of the communal experience of grief. And these lines of, of these, these lines are so moving that I think it's really easy to see the cathartic effect of these plays. And one aspect that I didn't talk about in my introduction to the trip, the plays, which I really should have, is that well, the structure is that they would do three tragedies. Usually they're interconnected plays like we have with the Oristia. And then they would do one satyr play, which is a comedy. And the idea that you would sort of, as a group, experience this grief through the tragedy and experience this comedy through watching this satyr play was like a process of sort of like expunging the communal emotions and that it was really, really healthy for them as a society to do. And when you read a play like this, like I think it's really easy to see how he would just have a, an audience of crying people sort of like bawling together. We also see that with loss of life comes loss of power. And this kind of correlates to that same idea where Atosa is meditating on the fact that they have all this wealth but no men to guard it. Atosa also meditates on the changing winds of fate, the idea of Lady Fortuna, for, the wheel of fortune, if you will. She has a wheel and the best place to be is in the center. So even as the revolutions of life go around, you're not disturbed too much. But if you're on the outside towards the edge of the wheel or on one of the spokes or something, you can be up and you can be down. Um, and so if you have a lot of influence, a lot of power, a lot of wealth, you're on the outside of this wheel, that means you can come crashing down. The response, the proper response is what we see her doing, is to take a position of humility. She takes off her fancy robes and puts on plain clothes. She begins this mourning process. She begins this self-humiliation process. 
and Atossa's, Atossa's offering to raise the ghost of Darius, I'm going to pause here, right before the ghost of Darius comes on the scene. It just reminds me so much of what Odysseus's process was when he went to the underworld and he was calling up the spirits himself. So again, I think there must have been sort of a an agreed upon set of imagery or set of offerings that someone would do to call up the dead in Greek conception. I don't know if this is something that they did very often or if it was something that only appeared in mythical stories. I have a feeling it's not really part of their day-to-day -day religious practice, but I'd be curious if somebody does know if they could comment that down below. And until next time. Hi, it's me again. And the light in my office has changed because I spent like maybe the next 40 minutes since I just finished filming, finishing the play. There actually was like very little left. And I only have a couple of notes. So I think I'm actually going to wrap this into the same video. And we will talk about the whole play. I'll give you my final thoughts on the ending. And I'll read something else for tomorrow. I'll read some more. I don't know what yet. So we find that once Darius is sort of raised from the dead, that the chorus is unable to speak to him. And so Darius turns to his queen, Queen Atosa. And this really shows her power and her competency in the midst of these elders who we have already seen are a little bit foolish, who have given a bad interpretation of her dream, who have potentially been bad counselors for Xerxes himself, maybe, speculating here. But Queen Atosa is the one with competency and authority able to meet the spirit of Darius and have a conversation with him. As they're sort of discussing the, you know, unbridled hubris of Xerxes' attempt to cross the Hellespont to um, attack by sea and by land in his horrible defeat, they say, surely some god had got a hold of his wits. And this is a really good example of the god within versus the god without. Earlier I mentioned how the gods had sort of frozen over the rivers, which caused the men to really suffer and die of thirst. They had to pray to the gods. to, And that's a really good example of the gods without. These like forces that are outside of ourselves that we can't really explain without, you know, talking about the gods or like the ancients felt that they couldn't explain without putting a supernatural power to it. But there's also the God within, and that was like my example in my video yesterday where I talked about how Aphrodite could take you over with lust. And it's like this desire that is completely unconscious, you know? It's when you're attracted to someone, it's not on purpose. You kind of can't help who you are and who you aren't attracted to. And this is sort of another way that they're explaining or exploring this idea of this pride that Xerxes is expressing. Atosa also says that Xerxes had bad companions who urged him on, who gave him bad counsel. There's a lesson there. But there's also, you know, an implied, and it even goes on, again, further criticism of m monarchy through this play is that, you know, it shows the vulnerability of the monarch and therefore the whole country because a king is just as likely as anybody else to be fallible and can be led astray by bad counselors, by gods, by his own desires. But the consequences are so much worse for someone who has such great influence. And then after this, we see that the spirit of Darius returns to the underworld. Queen Atosa, you know, is given this advice by Darius that her son is in tatters and in rags to so go find him suitable robes for the king to wear. But before she can return or intercept Xerxes, Xerxes come on stage and so he's still in his tattered rags. And this is emblematic of the state of his empire. He sort of becomes the, you know, the representative of his state. And it's also for a dramatic effect and it's very effective. And then we go into yet some more dialogue between himself and the chorus, expressing this grief, expressing this woe, sort of mourning the loss of various companions. And I just can't help but think that this play must have been very moving for people like Aeschylus who had experienced that conflict. That's the end of my conversation and discussion on this book, uh, or on this play, I should say. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed reading The Persians. I was really moved by the play. I can see why it's been so enduring and something that we return to when we talk about the ravages of war. And um, anyway, I highly recommend it. I hope you enjoy reading it as well. And I have no idea what I'm gonna read tomorrow. <laughs>
Okay, now I'm really leaving this time. Bye.